Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke, and today we're talking about an exciting topic, which is how to create your own graphical user interface in Python, or GUI as it's known. We're going to be using a built in library for Python called TKinter. Really cool. So let's jump in. But before I do, I want to ask anybody out there who's so inclined to consider supporting me on Patreon, where you get a number of benefits, including direct access to me. So let's jump in. I'm going to start by showing you a fully working, riveting game I wrote called number guess. I know, right? Really exciting. You're going to have to guess a number between one and 10. I know how exciting that is if you're half as excited as I am. I like using a full function example because it gives you a sense of how all the pieces work. But don't worry, what I'll do instead of trying to walk you through all the code at once, I kind of do it in layers by using different versions of the program. But let's start by running this program and then you get an idea of, of how it works. So here we have my riveting program. You see a label, enter a number from one to 10. You can't see too well in the window, but it says, welcome to number guess. We have this spin control here, which is great. We're gonna guess a number and we can say, okay, uh, I like three, is that it? And you get a little message box, wrong number. And I purposely made this easy by displaying what the number is. Six should be correct. And so we see you win, yay, aren't we lucky? So we, we got that working. And when we're done with this, we can just say cancel and everything works. At some point, you're going to want to build an interface. Maybe you're trying to build like a game. Maybe you're trying to build some sort of business application. And if you're not writing it as a web app, then you're probably going to want to use some sort of client-based GUI. We have a library for that. So let's see how to use it more. So that's the, uh, the full functioning program. Let's go to the first iteration, which is creating the basic window for that. The first thing we need to do to get things running, and let me show you how simple this particular version is. It's just opening a window. That's it, nothing fancy. And I just wanna show you how to do that much because that's at the beginning of everything. Without that, you don't get very far. Now I do put some useful links in my code here and you can get this code by just looking at the link in the description and that'll take you to GitHub where I store my code. First thing we gotta do is bring in our library. So we say from tkinter import asterisk. That'll get all the functions we're gonna need here. The most important thing we need to start off is the root. What is everything going to be pointing to? So when you're thinking about graphical user interface programming, you need to get used to a concept, which is a sort of widget hierarchy. All the different controls, buttons and labels and text boxes, et cetera, are called widgets. And the owner of all of these widgets is the window, right? And you can picture this, right? We've got all kinds of apps and you have a window, whatever you're using, and you close the window and everything disappears. So there's a hierarchy here. The window owns all of the widgets within it. And there can be a further hierarchy there, which could be maybe you have a tab control or some other control which owns its widgets. That tab control would roll up to a parent, which is the window again. So you can see this as a parent-child relationship or a tree structure. And it's important to keep that in mind when you're building GUIs because you've got to understand things are owned by that window. So to start things off, we're going to use the TK function, capital T, lowercase k parentheses. And I wrote this in Python 3, so it will not work with Python 2. And we see here, we're, we're returning this to our window variable. So it's just, we could have called it anything, we're calling it window. We want to give it a label, right? We want to have a nice little title in our window. So here we can say window title, and that function will assign welcome to number guess as the title. And we could let the window default to the size that it wants to, but here we're going to use a function called geometry to set the size of the window in pixels with the 900 being the width and the 150 being the height, so width and height. Now I'll come back to this later, but what that does is it scales the window up and we'll see the importance of that when we get to seeing controls in the window. This part's also really important and it dates back to the early days of graphical user interface programming. When I first learned this, it took a little getting used to because you actually had to create this loop and then you'd set the loop and it was an infinite loop that just kept running and was looking for people to do things, click a button, do a mouse over, whatever it is, but it's always watching and sort of polling to see if you do anything. Well, that's still there, it ain't gone. And the way it's implemented in this library is to use the main loop. So that's an event loop that's watching to see what you're doing and it's gonna keep running while your window is up. So it's really scanning over that window constantly to see, did you click, did you mouse over something, whatever events are coded for. And by the way, that's what we call code that executes and something happens when a user does something, it's called an event and you have code to go with that event. But as you've seen in here, this particular you know, window isn't doing anything yet. We've just got a window coming up. So not terribly exciting. 
And you can see there's a little bit of code just to get a window up. So you might be a little surprised, like, wow, that's a lot of work. And there is a little bit of coding when you're doing a graphical user interface, but it's worth it, right? Because you get an interface that looks better than just this text box popping up in someone's face, like uh, the normal input box you'd have in Python. So let's go to the second iteration, a little more added to our program. What do we got added this time, Brian? Well, let's see. We now have, first of all, it's bigger and easy to see, and I'll explain how I did that. But we have our buttons. They don't do nothing, but here you can see we have buttons. We have our nice spin widget. We have a label, enter a number. So we got a little more. It looks like a full GUI now, but it doesn't do anything. Let's take a look at the code a little bit. So we see the code we saw before, opening a window, nothing new there. This is something I wanted to call your attention to. If we didn't have this, let me show you what happens if I remove this line. Notice everything squinches up, it gets very tight. That's because I have the resolution on my monitor set pretty high. And so Tkinter is using that display size and it's shrinking. It's not very useful though when I'm trying to do a demo or maybe I just don't like this particular scale at all. So if I use this function here, which is window.tk call, I can do scaling and I'm saying increase to three times the size of what I had by the default. By doing that, now it looks a lot bigger, right? So this is much easier to read, better for my demos. You guys can see it and so can I. So that's cool. Let's add our widgets now. Let's see how we do that. And by the way, again, some links here, code link in the description. First thing we're gonna wanna do is create our label. There's a pattern in this library, which is whatever the widget is you want, then you use a function by that widget name. So label creates a label, button creates a button, great. And it's gonna return an object, right? So it's gonna return a label object. That's why we have to have our variable to catch that object. So here we're gonna create a label. We have to tell it what is the parent of this label? Who owns this widget? And as I mentioned, the window owns everything. So we're just gonna make this label owned by the window. What do we wanna display in this label, right? Labels are not something you can change manually. You can't type into them on the screen. We wanna put something in there. We're gonna say, enter a number from one to 10. So we're just putting some text in there. Where do we want to display it? Good question. We can use the grid function. So we're going to say label.grid. This is where we want it to display. Now, when we think of a grid, we can think of it sort of like this, right? It's a columns and rows kind of thing. So when we say zero, zero, it's the upper left-hand corner. That's where our label will display. We probably want our spin box to be right next to it. And then we're going to have our buttons below that. So that's the idea going on here. Now we've got to set up our spin box. Well, we're going to set our default value into a variable called txt underscore spin underscore value. We're not going to use it just yet. We then want to create our spin box. We do that by using the spin box function, right? It's going to be owned by the window. We want to start it at one. So the lowest value can be one. The highest value it's going to allow is 10. And it's really nice. It actually takes care of that for us. And let's set the default value to that variable. We set txt underscore spin dot value. That's right here. Great. So that takes care of that for us. Again, to display it where we want, we want to put this in column one. Notice right next to the label, that was column zero. And we'll put it in the same row, row zero. So very right at the top, but next to the label. So that takes care of getting our spin box going. Now we got to put our buttons in place. So guess what? I'll bet you figured this out. When we want to create a button, we use the button function. We need to tell it who owns this button and it's the window. And Here's the text we want to display, okay. We need to place it somewhere. So we wanna place it right under the label we created above, so that's column zero, but we want it to be in the row below it, so it's gonna be row two. And remember, we're storing this in BTN okay. What I really mean by storing is, we have a reference to that button in the variable BTN okay. And that's important because we need to reference that at different points in our program. Now we're gonna create the cancel button, BTN cancel. Here we have button, right? the window it belongs to, right? And then the text we want to display. And again, here we're going to say display it in column one, which will be next to the OK button, and row two, again, next to the OK button. So we're all good here. Still have our main loop below it. So we're all set. Make sure that's at the end. I want to you know, really call attention to, though, naming conventions in GUI programming is extremely important. Most important thing when you're naming your widgets is to give them meaningful names that you can find later. And although this sort of prefixing things that used to be like Hungarian notation or camel case notation is a little outdated in many cases, in the case of GUIs, it can be useful because it can be hard to say, like, what did I call that button? And what did I call that text box? And the busier your screen gets with different objects, the harder it is. So having conventions is the most important. 
exactly what you use for conventions is not as important as the fact that there's consistency. So you can find things and other people you're programming with can also understand where to find things. So this convention is BTN means it's a button. In Windows, sometimes they use CMD for command button. And then, you know, something meaningful, like it's a cancel button. In this case, it's OK. You know, it's an OK button. That kind of thing is useful. In the case of uh, spin, I just called it spin number. So I wasn't too good. I probably should have said SPN in uppercase. I said spin and then number, so uppercase. Uh, label, that should probably be LBL something. But just make sure you can find things. This is a very simple example, so I'm keeping it pretty straightforward. But with a lot of objects in here, it can get very confusing very quickly. So again, one time more before we move on to the next more complicated code. What we get here is just a nice little form suitable for framing, but it doesn't really do anything yet. So now let's add the logic that goes behind this. So we can see we have all the stuff we had before, but what's different is we're going to put in some code that will react to the buttons. That's all we're doing here. So if somebody clicks on the OK button, then it's going to run this code BTN OK underscore clicked. And then it's just going to print the spin number and nothing else. It's not going to do anything too fancy yet. And if they click on the cancel button, it's going to close the window because it's only one command. We can just say window dot destroy and it closes our window. But how does it know to run that code when you click a specific button? Well, we didn't include it earlier, but now we add command equal. And what command equal is what code do I want to attach to this button? So in this case, we're saying run the function btn ok underscore click. So when this button is clicked, this operand right here to the function tells it to run this function. Okay, And when the cancel button is clicked right here, we've told it to run btn cancel clicked. Now, this naming is pretty important because it's very easy to understand when you see a function name, btn cancel underscore click, that that's the code that function will run when the btn cancel button is clicked. Again, it can get very confusing very quickly. So keeping conventions clean and simple like that helps a lot. Windows actually has default naming conventions to do things like that. Uh, but it's a good idea to explicitly do it because that's a Pythonic thing, right? Be explicit rather than implicit. So there's no question. What's going to run when you click these buttons? We didn't really put all the logic in here yet, but let me just show you how this looks when we run it. So we can see if we do OK. You can just see down here we've printed out the value, as we said, in a print function. So it doesn't show up in our GUI. And now if we click cancel, it closes the window. So we're almost there. Now we almost have a full program. So we're going to go to the last version, which is the final version. And the only real thing I'm doing different here is I'm implementing the logic for the game, which isn't a lot here, right? So what I'm going to be doing is saying is the spin control has a function called get, and that will get the text version of the value of what's stored in there, right? Because it's all going to be text. So here we're saying get our spin number control, get the value of that, and return it to variable guess. Problem is that's in a string format. So we're going to convert it to an integer by just using the int function. So look at what we're doing here is we're getting the string value of our spin control and then converting it into an integer. We're going to return that value to guess. Now we have a number here I haven't shown you yet. That's our random number that we need to guess. Now I did this print just to make it easier for us. But the way we can get a random number is we import the random library. And here I'm going to run random dot random int 1 to 10 to get a number and then print it here. But that's going to be my random number that I need to guess. Like, what is that number? So here we're going to say, well, if guess, right, we just got that from the spin control. If guess is equal to my number, in Python, you say equal equal to compare the equality of two different values. So if guess equal equal my number, then display a message box which says, congratulations, you win. And uh, you're good to go. You, you're done. You win. But if it doesn't, it's going to say, sorry, wrong number. That's really it. Very simple. The rest of this is uh, pretty much everything you've already seen. So let's run this. And we can see under here, it actually does have a value of one. So I'd be careful about that. So I'm going to change this just so we get some. Let me try that. Is it five? And it says wrong number. OK. I know it's one. So I'll go back to one and say, OK. It says you win. Yay. That's it. And we can say cancel to get out. One final thing I did want to mention, though, is if you've noticed, the message boxes I put up 
Um, I didn't show you how to do those, so let me show you that. So we did talk a little bit about message boxes. I didn't go into too much detail. Show info is a built-in function. So you can say message box that show info, and that will give an information message box. And we can put a title on it of the window that pops up and then the message you want. But to use these, if you look above at the very top, we have to import the message box separately from tkinter. Unfortunately, one of the things I was looking online saying, could I scale up the way I did the window? Could I just make it three times as big? Because you notice it's hard to read. But according to the research I did online, it says there's no way to just push this up and make it bigger. So if you wanted to have a message box that scaled the way the other windows did, you might have to create a custom window and display that instead. I wanted to mention too, if you want to do more research, and you're like me, I like to read books all the time. And this is a book I downloaded. I have the uh, Kindle version, which I really like. And I've been reading through it. I think it's a great book. It's well organized. It's clean. I didn't, I'm didn't. i not getting any kind of sponsorship here. I don't know the author. I just thought it was pretty good. There might be other books better out there. I just got this one and I liked it. It was pretty comprehensive. And it talks about implementing data-centric kind of applications like maintaining data, which is always something I like using like SQLite or something. So I thought this was pretty good. There are some advanced functionalities that it also gets into, like how to tailorize the look of it to change colors and the way things look. So it looks a little more slick. So if you're interested, you may want to take a look at that book. It's available on Amazon. Enough said. So wrapping up, there's a lot here. Pretty short video, but you get an introduction to graphical user interface programming, how it works, and we learned that when you're going to do this, you have the library, and we learned that TK Inter is free, available, and part of Python, so you don't have to do anything if you use it. And you give someone a script, they can run it without importing any extra libraries, which is a nice feature of it. The other thing we learned, though, is a common thing whenever you're doing graphical programming is that you have to have this sort of parent object. It's a tree structure. That's the way the objects are. And the dependent objects are called widgets. The parent is a window, right? So we've got this window and it owns all the widgets and they can be widgets that own other widgets. So it can be as complex a hierarchy as you can imagine. We also learned it's important that we name things in a very consistent way so we can find them and understand when we're looking at code, what we're looking at. I like to take the execution code, the stuff we serve where it's like, you know, btn okay underscore click. I like to put all that logic into a separate script from the main logic because typically the user interface itself, the buttons and everything else probably aren't changing that often. But the code you may want to run behind them can change quite a bit. Like maybe I want to add some logging behind the, the OK button, or maybe I want to make it more sophisticated or email somebody or whatever it is I want to do. So I like to keep that as a separate thing. Then I can sort of organize it separately. But naming conventions are extremely important when you do that. That's it for this time. I plan to do a little more with this and build on this as to what we can do with it and perhaps look at other libraries. There's one called PyQt, and there's a bunch of different libraries for doing graphical user interfaces in Python, but tkinter is the default. It's been around a long time. It doesn't seem like it's going anywhere, so good place to start. That's it for this time. Thank you. Please like, share, subscribe. Until next time, I'm Paul Boyer. We're all in this together. Thank you.